Welcome back to the That's My Dad podcast. Got a very special guest today. He holds a distinction we're going to get to in a minute. I think he knows what that is. <laughs> uh, Tommy Goggins is with us. Tommy is a financial planner and the father of eight children. Eight indeed, yes. Uh, how many? Can you say all their names, Tommy? I can. So my oldest is uh, Tommy the Fourth, and then there's Natalie, uh, George Edward, Garrett, Kella, Nisa, Lena, and Patrick. All right, good. Yeah. And they're and they're what age ranges are? They? So my oldest Tommy is twenty four, and my youngest Patrick is ten. And you have a grandbaby who's one. I, yes, yeah, <laughs> not, grandpa. Yeah, so uh, we we really planned this out really well. I've got a yeah. grandchild and nine year old. Yeah, <laughs> You're not so. going to get a break. <laughs> no. So every time I think about Tommy, I think about there was an old country comedian, and, and probably nobody remember. Well, maybe they do. Jerry Clower was okay. an old country comedian from Mississippi. <laughs> And they would say, Jerry, what was your sibling's name? He said, well, there was Ardell, Burnell, Raynell, W.L., Anell, Faynell, Janelle, <laughs> Claude, Eugene, and Clovis. And so I always think about uh, Jerry Clower when, when I think of you, Tommy. Um, we've been friends for a long time, and you're a, you're a very highly respected person in our community. And, uh, and when I thought about who we would bring in to talk about fatherhood, I thought, well, you know, how many guys could – can raise eight kids i mean that's that's unheard of in fact i think my great grandfather was the last person i ever knew that had that many wow so t- tell us tell us that story i mean you and erica did, did was this uh i mean did you meet her and say hey i want to have eight kids and spend the rest of my life with you or how'd, that, how'd that come about no absolutely not no it uh <laughs> it was not planned by any stretch of the imagination so Uh, I met my wife in Tuscaloosa. We were both uh, had been students at the University of Alabama. And at the time, uh, I was working at a department store uh, called Parisian, which is now Belk. Uh, They were acquired a few years ago. Uh, And Erica was working there, too. I met her. And I will tell you this. When the first couple of weeks working there, uh, I absolutely hated it. I absolutely hate it. I didn't know anyone there. I had moved there from Gadsden, and, uh, but, it, but it worked out. And once I kind of got my legs under me, it was good. Uh, so I, I was actually going to uh, clock in one day. And so you would go up these steps, and the break room was upstairs, and the, the time clock was up there. Yeah. That was when you actually had to, to clock in yeah, back, click, back in the click, dark click, ages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I was walking up the steps, kind of not – you know, really paying attention, just kind of doing whatever I was doing. And I looked up and Erica was coming down the steps and uh, we met eyes and I was just, yeah, it was just like, wow. And so we had our first, uh, our first date. We went to uh, the Waffle House one day after. uh, That's uh, a good story. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, After our, um, after, you know, we got off work one evening and just sat down and talked and it was just the beginning of, of uh, what has been just, the most amazing blessing from God outside of salvation that, that I've ever been given. Yeah. Wow. So do people ask you very often, um, about reality TV shows? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought so. I mean, you're a conservative Christian black man. Yes. I, I mean, I, I click a lot of boxes that are yeah. somewhat unusual to have all clicked together. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I think it'd make, make a great show. I saw your wife, Erica at the library and, and, and it, she homeschooled. Yes, right? yeah. So still that's another box that's clicked. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I saw her at the library, and they came walking in. And you know, I'm thinking, in my experience, anytime we're eight or more together, there's chaos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so she had eight kids following her like little ducks, yes. and she was walking through the library. They weren't saying a word. Yep. And I thought, my goodness, did. What, is she Benadrilling them, or no. what's no. what's up with that? They're the most well behaved kids I've ever seen. We both had the benefit of having uh, very old school parents, uh, oh, okay. and, and as such, we were very old school parents. And there was just certain ways that uh, a household was supposed to be run, certain th- ways that kids were supposed to behave, certain ways they behave uh, at home with their brothers and sisters, their mom and dad, certain ways yeah. they behave out in public, and that's just how we. That's how we rolled in the guy. Yeah, you've, you've taught some respectable kids. I mean, they, they, they're, some of them are adults now, and, and I know how respectable they are as adults. Mm-hmm. So let's go back and talk about that. Your, your family of origin, your, your, your parents. I've never talked to you about this. Okay. So yeah. this is going to be fresh information to me. Tell me about your, your family. Yes. Yeah, so up. both of my parents grew up uh, in Alabama. 
I was not raised in Alabama. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, they both grew up in, in Alabama. My mom actually grew up in Atala. And uh, my dad grew up in a place called Cottage Grove, which is down around Sylacauga, that area there. Uh, I don't know that Cottage Grove is still even in existence uh, today, but that's where he grew up. And both of my parents uh, were children in in large families. So they both came from from what would be considered very large families today. And uh, my father, uh, when he turned uh, 18, uh, went into the Navy enlisted into the Navy and uh, went all over the world and and saw things. And I I think in many ways it gave him a perspective that was probably very different from what he saw growing up in, you know, my father was born in 1925 in in Alabama, Uh, went into the Navy. And he survived that. Yes, yes. (laughs) Prior to the Navy being, uh, you know, desegregated. So, I mean, uh, so he had an interesting background there. And, and uh, I, I can remember going through some old photos and seeing um, my, my father who would become an, uh, an enlisted officer. Uh, but I, I remember a, a photo of his uh, officer uh, class. And there may be four rows of guys and there may be, I don't know, there had to be at least 20, 25 uh, uh, soldiers lined up and there were four mm-hmm. rows. And there were only two of them. Uh, that were black. My father was was, wow. was one of the two. And so uh, despite all that, though, he raised uh, my sister and I with a very, uh, just a very view the world as it is, a very uh, no chip on your shoulder, don't yeah. make, wow. you know, excuses, work hard, uh, treat everybody as individuals. And so I have a lot mm-hmm. of respect for my father, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a lot about yeah. that. So sounds like you had a close relationship with your dad. And I, I appreciate what you said, because, you know, there, there are a lot of thoughts out there about the racial issue. Mm. But what I kept telling the kids at the ranch was you, you, you make life – what, what it can be. Yes. So your dad came out of a situation where he, he could have taken a different attitude. He could have taken a very different attitude. And I, um, you know, Christ teaches us to be gracious and humble and kind and to try to bear each other's burdens. And I, I'm, I, I get that, but sometimes it's, it's difficult for me to uh, feel like sometimes today when I hear um, men and women talk about how difficult they have it in life today. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's hard for me to 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 have uh, perhaps the sympathy that I should when yeah. I think about the fact of you know my father had it pretty tough growing yeah. up in Alabama yeah. in 1925 and then yeah. going off into the military and could have chosen some different ways to view life, but just always had great respect for all human beings. And uh, there's just some great stories of I remember my dad being in the VFW and things like that, and that. Yeah. that People just love my dad. And it was because he loved people as they were and never saw people in terms of their uh, social economic background, their color, or I- any of that. They were just people. They were image bearers created in the image of God. And it was. Uh, and, and that's that's what you are today. Yes, absolutely. That's, so so is there a particular moment in time that you can think of that your dad did something that you thought, wow, that this guy's special? So, you know, um, I was thinking about that, and there, there are so many things. And, and I, I, one story that always comes to, to mind, and I think it, it goes to the core of just how my dad viewed responsibility. And so I always played football, and uh, in particular, I think my eighth grade year, uh, I failed not only one but two classes, okay, two classes that I failed. Uh, I did not fail math or science or any of those. I failed typing, and I failed art. <laughs> yes. And, and I failed them because I just, I didn't do the work. Uh, yeah. I just wasn't very interested in it. I, I Typing, I probably just goofed off most of the time. But I got, I got two Fs and uh, they came home on the report card. My dad saw those and he said, well, you know, two things are going to happen. Number one, uh, you're not playing football next year. Now oh, this, no. this happened... I remember it must have happened in the spring because we were going into summer break. So he already said, next year, you're you're not playing football at all. On top of that, uh, I've I've talked with the teachers, and they will allow you to do the work that you should have done before, and you're going to spend summer doing the makeup work in both typing and the makeup work in uh, the art class. And I remember, I, I don't, 
I don't know how my dad worked this out. I don't know if he worked this out with the teachers, but I remember <laughs> going down to the elementary school during the <laughs> summer and, and doing this work. I, I remember having to make this work up. And, you know, as a kid, you, you do that and you're like, okay, I, I've kind of, I've, I've, I've made my penance, right? I mean, yeah. I, I've done the typing work. I've done the artwork. And we got around to fall. No football. Uh-oh. And I remember, I mean, I was always a starter, and I remember sitting uh, oh. and watching these games and watching all my friends play, watching somebody play in my position. That uh, wasn't me. That's traumatic. It, it was. It, yeah. it was. At the time, I, at the time, I thought, this is so unfair. I, I, Lord, why? Why have you, you cursed me with this yeah. father who would do this to me? Yeah. Um, but at the end of that, you know, it was over. I never failed two classes like that again. That never happened again. Uh, and I ended up having to work really hard next year, earning my starting spot back. The most important thing, though, from all of that was that it taught me the importance of discipline. And it taught me the importance of commitment. And it taught me that there's a consequence when you don't live up to your commitments. And right. uh, if you do wrong, you've got you got to make amends. you got to repent and and. and and make up for that. So how have you instilled that in your kids? How, how do you go about instilling those values in your own children? You know, it's, it's a lot of, I say all the time that I have become my father. I, I really oh, have. Yeah. And yeah. There, there'll be times where yeah. I'll be saying something or disciplining one of the kids and, and I'm sitting there and it's like, I, it's coming out of my mouth, but at the same time, it's like, I'm hearing Tom Goggins speak in my ear, even, yeah. even as I'm doing this. Yeah. Um, it's just very simply, it, it, my father loved the Lord, and he was a just uh, devoted, un- unapologetic follower of Christ Jesus. And wow. he taught us to live that way. And so f- for us as parents, me as a father, it's just living out the principles that we find in Scripture, trying to be the, 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 a picture of Christ uh, to my children in and, and both Living that out in what I say and do, uh, and then also trying to teach and instruct and encourage them to embrace those same principles. So, do you think your dad did he make any mistakes? Oh, that you can remember? Sure, yeah. Did any of those stick out in your mind? I mean, my parents sent me to piano lessons. That was about as bad as it got, as far as I was concerned. You know, my I think my father uh, was very he was he was very stern. Now he wasn't mean. But he was very demanding and very stern. And um, he could be somewhat unforgiving uh, at at times when you did not do what was expected to be done. Uh, And I've I've come to see now you look at things in in a different light. And there were some things that um, dad probably uh, punished us for, punished me for that in the grand scheme of things were probably not nearly as big of a deals as, okay. as, as, as he thought they were at the time. Right. Uh, I've been guilty of the same thing uh, as a father, uh, things that I make a really big deal out of that probably are not that big of a deal. And I've had to go back to the kid and say, I'm sorry, forgive oh, me. That's, yeah. That's you know, hard. I, you know, I'm, I was a little too harsh there. Or I jumped into something, assumed some facts that weren't necessarily facts. Sorry. So, yeah. Yeah. So I've had to do that too, and it's a, it's a humbling experience to oh. have to tell your son, "Hey, I messed up on this one. Sorry about that." And but but you gotta you gotta put your big boy pants you on do. sometimes and do that. It is. Um, I, I, if if I can, I, one story about that sure. comes to mind that, that I remember, and I've I've told uh, well the kids I didn't have to tell them they lived it, but I've shared it with other people. So the year that uh, so as you can imagine, Eric and I are, are obviously uh, Alabama fans. Um, we love everybody. Uh, Jesus loves everybody, but we we are roll tide. And, but he loves Alabama and, more, yeah, right? And, uh, I did not say that. <laughs> roll um, tide. We're huge Alabama fans, and so uh, the year that uh, the, the dreaded uh, you know kick six, oh, the yeah. dreaded year of that, and so uh, at the time <laughs> we might want to just relive that. Can we, yeah, no. Can the producers find that tape and we'll just no. we'll just rerun that? <laughs> yeah, no. Let's please not relive that. Uh, so. Uh, we would always be, uh, at the time my mom lived in South Carolina, and so we would always be visiting her for Thanksgiving, and we would be there, and we would just always watch the game there. And so we uh, had just finished watching uh, the dreadful end to, the, to that game, and, you know, we're kind of just 
beside ourselves and I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, I can't believe that. And they, you know, who could have seen that coming? And Eric was like, they never, they never should have tried that, that field goal. They, they never should have done that. Yeah. I thought, well, you know, no one could have, could have seen that, that, that coming. I mean, that was just who, who does that? And, uh, she just really made me mad assuming and, and just almost acting like, well, you, someone should have expected someone to feel that kick and run it back for a touchdown. Yeah. And I, I'm telling you, I did not <laughs> yell. I didn't get belligerent, but I was pretty sharp tongued just in telling oh, her no. that she didn't understand about football and da, 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 da. And yeah. I'm doing this in front of all the kids and what I mean, I was emotionally wrapped up in yeah. this. And uh, so it was a few minutes later and, and, you know, after I calmed down, then, Holy Spirit started speaking to me and he started chastising me and I had to that evening. I gathered all the kids together and I gathered Erica together and I, I had to apologize and it was serious. You know, I had to say, listen, oh, wow. uh, football should not cause dad to act like that. And a uh, husband doesn't treat his wife like that over something as silly as a football game. And, mm. and it was very, 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 very humbling. Yeah. Uh, and it was very, very difficult, but uh, it's good for our kids to see that we're human and that we make mistakes. So, what what do you think? You need now. You've you're a guy with some experience. You got eight kids. I do. What do you think the real key to being a great dad is? I think to be a great dad, you have to know what a great dad is. You have to understand how a great dad behaves, how he thinks how he speaks, uh, what he says, what he doesn't say, what he does, what he doesn't do. I think that is key. It's essential. We cannot be or aspire to something that is foreign to us that we have no idea of. However, he's the, all of us did not have uh, the pleasure and the blessing and the opportunity to have a great dad. Right. And so... I believe we have to know what a great dad is, but we don't necessarily had to have had a great dad in order to be a great dad. So I think that the sub answer to your question is yeah. following the life and the example of Christ Jesus and seeing how he dealt with people of all kinds of situations in all kinds of aspects of life. We can look at the life of this man and draw from that lessons in how do we respond to people who don't treat us nicely? What do we do when we're angry? What do we do when we're sad? What do we do when we have to correct people who truly are in error? How do we treat women? Uh, if you want to learn about how to treat women, look at the life of Jesus. A lot we can learn there. So I think for me, if someone were to add, my answer to your question would be understanding the person of Christ Jesus, I believe is key to being a great dad. So you think that it's possible that a kid that grew up with no training, no dad, no never been to church, maybe even was abused, is it possible for those guys to turn things around and and become great dads themselves? Absolutely, I believe it's possible. What what do you think it is in in our society? We have an epidemic. I think I read 20 million children in the United States are growing up without a dad in the home. What do you think it's going to take to, to turn that around? I think the only thing you can do to turn something like that around is you have to have men who are willing to draw the line in the sand and say, regardless of uh, who my father was, uh, there are plenty of guys I know that uh, don't even know who their father was. Yeah. Regardless of who he was, regardless of whether he was in my life or not, regardless of how he treated me or not treated me, uh, I get to make a decision about the type of man I'm going to be. Mm. And if those men say, I want to be a father one day, and not just a father, because it's easy to be a dad, right? I mean, that's just biology. Anybody can do that. Mm. But I want to be a great dad. I want to be a great father. And you think that's possible? I think that's possible. They can say, I want to be a great dad and a great father, and God will take that willingness to be a great dad and father. It's okay if you don't know how to do it. Okay, that's He'll equip you, and he will bring people in your life. I mean, you, you've, you've lived it every day. You have been the example of a good father, a great father to a lot of boys who had nothing but bad examples. Anybody who makes that decision can have an opportunity 
to learn from others and to see what it takes. And if they're willing to model that and walk it out, then yes, they can be great dads. I believe that that is possible for any man who might be listening to this, regardless of their past, regardless of their history. Wow. I think so too. But I I think that there's a culture out there that says, nah, it's not possible. And it's our, it's, it's our role to say, Hey, it can be done. I think about your dad, you know, your dad, he grew up during Jim Crow. Yeah. Uh, and, And my ancestors were wrong, frankly. To, to have allowed that, much less caused it. But instead of your dad saying, well, I'm going to be a victim, I'm going to be mad at the world, he said, this is the hand that I've been dealt. I'm going to make the most of it. And I admire that so much. I think that's something that's missing, not just among any particular race, but among the human race. Absolutely. There's such a, a tendency these days to want to be a, a victim. Yes. It's like being a victim has become popular. Yes. Everybody's looking for a, to be a victim of something. And I, I, I see in your dad, and I've never heard of that story, though, about your dad, but I see that things could have gone either way. They could have gone either way, yes. And you could have very easily been one of those guys that was angry, blaming other people, a victim, and you could have carried that on to your family. Yeah. And your eight kids would have carried that on to their families. And somewhere, it happened to be in your case with your dad, he broke that cycle. He did. And, you know, one of the greatest gifts I think my dad gave my sister and I was he gave us an objective, untainted view of the world. And he did not put upon us the realities of what he lived through and saw. Uh, and he chose not to live life blaming other people for things that they individually were not responsible for. The good news is that uh, we all uh, can make decisions and we can plot out uh, a course uh, that is different than the course that was a part of our history and our heritage. The bad news is that our history and our heritage uh, predisposes us uh, to, to, to a certain path. Doesn't mean we have to stay on that path, but oftentimes those are the shoes we're comfortable in. That's the coat we're comfortable wearing. Yeah. Yeah. And what it takes is someone outside of ourselves to say, you know, hey, you know, you don't have to wear that coat. You can put on a different coat. Even yeah. though that coat is comfortable, I, I tell you what, if you take off that coat and put on another one, you wear another one for a long enough time, it'll start to feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. And over time, it'll be more comfortable than the coat that you came here with. And there'll be a point you won't even want that old coat anymore. Right. So look into the, the camera. And I want you to th- think you've probably already said this in so many ways. But for that young man that might be just happen up on this program. And he comes out of that situation where he doesn't have a father to teach him the right way. And he feels like he's never going to be anything and and just give him some hope. Mm. Just take just a minute and, and, and just give that young man some hope. You know, I was blessed through no uh, greatness of mine or through no um, <clears throat> worthiness on my part to grow up in a home with not only one, uh, but two loving parents and to grow up with a great father. And I recognize the older I get, the more I recognize that that is not the reality for many of us. That's not the reality for you. And unfortunately, you've had a situation that has not been a good situation. It's been a terrible situation. It's maybe been a situation that has injured you, has hurt you, has harmed you in ways that are beyond probably what many people could even understand or could even comprehend. My encouragement to you is that your past does not have to write your future. It does not have to be that way. The truth is this, uh, that you were created for a purpose, and despite whatever happened in your life, despite whatever mistreatment happened, despite whatever abuse, heartache, That purpose was given to you by someone who uh, loves you. And no other human being can take away that purpose. 
Thank you, Tony. That's powerful. I want to close by letting you do something. Your, your dad is no longer with us. That's correct. Yeah, he's uh, he died uh, in uh, 2000, February of 2000, um, okay. actually about 22 years ago. I want to give you the opportunity to assume that your dad's watching. And what would you say to him? What do you want to say to your dad? Hmm. Dad, you you did great. Uh, and you did great not because you were perfect. Um, and I think you know that. Perfection was never the goal. But you did great because you instilled in me uh, what it meant and what it means to be a good man. And if a man understands what it means to be a good man, then that man will be a good husband, he'll be a good father, he'll be a good son, he'll be a good uncle, he'll be a good friend. In every day, uh, as a father and now as a grandparent, uh, I hope to pass along the gift that you gave me of being selfless, of being someone who thought about me other than yourself. I'm passing that gift forward and giving it uh, to my boys. Uh, and uh, I've been delighted to be able to see uh, my son, your grandson, being able to pass that forward to his son. Uh, indeed, you broke a cycle and you chose uh, to uh, live a life that was different than the life you could have lived. And that has affected not only your life, but it has inf uh, affected uh, an entire generation, and I thank you for that. And there will be many generations of Tommies. So we're now in Tommy the Fifth. Uh, there will be many generations of Tommies who will look back to that uh, to you and uh, will thank you for that, as I am thankful for that. Wow, thank you, Tommy Goggins. Powerful, powerful story. Wow, I don't know. Don't have anything else to add to that. Thank you, Tommy. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure you're pouring your heart out and. Uh, you're an example that a lot of a lot of people need to follow. So thank you for being a part of that. And that'll wrap up this episode of the That's My Dad podcast. Hope we've inspired somebody. We'll be back next week. Try to inspire you some more. Thanks. As something extra here at the end of this episode, we have three videos from three of Tommy's kids uh, talking about their dad. Enjoy. Hey dad, it's Garrett here. There are so many things that we could talk about of how great of a father you are to us, but one of those things I want to focus on is your openness to us. I'm so glad that we have a father who cares about um, what we think and cares about what um, we're going through. I thank you that you're open to talk to us and encourage us through no matter whatever we're going through. I just thank you and I hope you find this encouraging. Hi dad. I just wanted to spend some time to tell you the encouraging things you do for me. And one of those things is that you're very caring, and I'm very thankful for that. And I hope that you find this very encouraging because there are a bunch of things that you provide for us that we don't even see. And I'm very glad that you're always willing to give us things to enjoy. I hope you find this very encouraging, and thank you for everything that you do. Hi, Dad. There are just so many things I like about you, and one of them is that you teach us to be consistent and have a constant character and just keep following God the same way over and over again and I really like that about you and another thing is that you teach us to be peaceable and to just get along with each other and have fun together so I really like that about you thanks for teaching us thanks so much for tuning in today this has been the That's My Dad podcast with our host, Scott Hilton, where we're on a mission to break the cycle of generational fatherlessness and inspire fathers to become great dads. We'll be back here every Monday night at 6 p.m. We'll see you then.